thank you so much for the introduction. I know I kept changing my name on you, Victoria, but um, we'll just go with Ebony Swanson. Um, all right. So I just want to start um, by acknowledging the land that I'm on and recognizing um, that I'm located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, um, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So just quickly about me, um, probably why I kept on changing my names and I'm not paying attention to things as I'm currently 34 weeks pregnant, um, and it's been quite an adventure in Victoria, I would like to give a very, very big thank you to you for supporting um, me as I navigated um, this practicum during pregnancy. Um, I definitely couldn't have gone through everything without your guidance and support, so thank you. And I would also like to thank um, Dr. Matthew Little, who was my practicum supervisor. Um, Matt is also an assistant professor here at the School of Public Health and Social Policy, and I was very fortunate um, to join his research team, uh, who are currently looking at the impacts of fresh food prescription programs on health uh, and food uh, insecurity um, in partnership with the Community Health Center in Guelph, Ontario. So just today, my presentation is going to focus a bit on the background, um, just what is food insecurity and what are fresh food prescription programs. Um, I'll briefly talk about um, my project and why I chose a scoping review, um, and then just focusing on some of the main or interesting results and conclusions that I found. So food insecurity um, is a lack of access and um, lack of access and economic resources to purchase nutritious and safe foods in socially acceptable ways. And as we all know, um, food security is um, a very important social determinant of health. And so it can be defined at both the household and community level. So at a community level, food security uh, can only be achieved when all residents in a community have access to enough food through a sustainable food system. So just for the purposes of my presentation, uh, when I'm referring to food security or food insecurity, I'm referring to it at the household, household or individual level. So a fairly recent 2017, um, 2018 survey found that one in eight Canadians, um, one in eight Canadian households has been food insecure within the previous 12 months. And we know that the groups most vulnerable to food insecurity include families headed by single females, indigenous peoples, black and other racialized communities, marginally housed and homeless people, as well as new immigrants. And so as a result, food insecurity does further perpetuate um, health inequities that these groups tend to see. And we also know that the impacts of food insecurity are realized at both an individual level through poor physical and mental health outcomes and at a societal level through um, economic impacts. So in childhood, food insecurity increases the risk of depression, suicidal ideation and developing depression adulthood, while food insecure adults are at a higher risk of developing chronic conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and arthritis. Uh, food security has also been found to be a strong predictor of increased utilization of the healthcare system. So one potential way of combating food insecurity through longer term solutions is through social prescribing. And what is social prescription? So it's a process in which primary care professionals will link patients with community level supports that are typically outside the realm of the healthcare system. And this process can be seen in many different forms and one of which is food prescription, which I focused on for my project. So with food prescription programs, patients are generally prescribed vouchers by healthcare practitioners that can be exchanged for fresh fruit and vegetables. So this leads to my primary project, which was to complete a scoping um, review for the purpose of um, just answering broader questions on the research topic and identifying gaps um, within existing research. So we know that there's not a lot um, of information on food prescription programs and their um, impacts on health or food insecurity. And so this was just to get a general idea of what is known, um, what is known in general. And for my scoping review, I followed the framework um, outlined by Arksky and O'Malley, which you can see here. So uh, my guiding research question was, what is the extent, range, and nature of 
research on the impact of food prescription programs on food insecurity or self-reported health and clinical health metrics. And by clinical health metrics, um, I'm talking about cardiometabolic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, um, as well as um, BMI. So let me just go to the next slide here. So um, here is my Prisma um, diagram, and you can see that the following the search process, I was left with um, a total of 11 articles for my review. And so just looking at the inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, so it's fairly wide as there appeared to be limited evidence on this topic. So there were no limitations on the year published or location of the study in order to capture the widest breadth of evidence. Um, articles did need to be in English and then they needed to include the impact of prescription programs on either food security or um, health outcomes. Um, so those clinical health metrics that I spoke just spoke about or self-reported health. And Interestingly, of the 11 studies I found, all were conducted in the U.S. Um, it is a fairly new research area, so 10 of the 11 were published in 2016 or later, um, and 10 of the 11 studies also focused on results of adults um, 18 years of age or older. So highlighting just some of the results, there are both quantitative and qualitative studies um, included in this review. So four of the five studies that were specifically looking at food security, household food security levels, um, four found significant improvement in food security scores, indicating um, that participation in these prescription programs did have beneficial results on participants and their ability to access food. Um, another uh, study specifically looked at HbA1c levels, which are used to get an overall picture of average blood sugar levels over a period of weeks or months, and is an important measurement for um, people with diabetes. And that study found a significant decrease in, um, in these levels um, in participants of the prescription program. Um, there are also a number of studies doing interviews with participants highlighting the positive perce perceptions of the various prescription programs. Um, so the parents and caregivers who were interviewed share their appreciation of the program um, and its impacts on their children's health, as well as the caregiver's own ability um, to support their kids. So um, one of the quotes that I appreciated just in terms of food security was one participant said that I never expected to go home with this huge bag of vegetables and fruits and I do sometimes and sometimes it's a blessing because I really need it. Um, and then somebody else spoke about how the prescription program increased their spending power and um, they said they still spend between 60 and $100. Um, but what helped me was that before I bought very little amounts of fruit and vegetables. Um, so I, now I know my children are eating more vegetables, even though I spent the same. So um, just a few quotes to show the impact of um, these programs. Um, some of the barriers to implementation of the programs is just lack of program communication. So just ensuring that um, everybody managing or who's part of the program is able to communicate with the participants in order to ensure program retention um, and as well um, for participants to get the most out of the program. And then the education piece here um, is kind of around um, just food literacy and just understanding the importance of including fresh fruits and vegetables in um, their diet. So programs are more successful when that piece was included. So what I found um, despite the lack of literature as fresh food prescription programs do have the ability to address food insecurity and um, poor health outcomes. Um, so the results were very promising and just in future recommendations, I mean, as I said, all of the studies were in the US, so we're needing more studies within the Canadian context, which is something um, Dr. Little, my supervisor was working on. Um, and as well, studies looking at additional clinical health metrics, um, as these ones really only focused on HbA1c um, and BMI, which I didn't really include in the results as I find BMI to be um, a problematic measurement um, that does not really adequately address health and well-being. Um, and as well, the duration of the studies needs to be longer. Um, out of all of the studies, 10 were six months. Um, or shorter, so longer durations are needed to understand the long-term sustainability of these programs. Um, and these prescription programs, 
I believe can improve um, access to affordable and nutritious foods, um, which is a big component of addressing food um, insecurity. So given that the food prescription programs and social prescribing in general provide a way for public health practitioners to move away from short-term relief efforts um, and build capacity while empowering individuals, um, there's kind of a big reason and I think a strong possibility that we need to look more at um, what's going on. Um, and food prescription programs, lastly, are a way to reach populations that are more likely to be living in food insecure households as they partner with community resources um, and allow us to address some of the social determinants of health. Um, oops. Well, you can also see your chat. Um, and we're kind of eliminating health um, inequities. Um, so it's addressing the need for partnerships and bridging communication outside of traditional silos and public health that we tend to see. Oh, and I'm already on my questions page. Lovely. 